And it always lags a second before we're actually, oh, we have so many people here. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. We are super, super excited. If you've been watching me at all, you know how obsessed I am with Lorraine Heath lately. Um, I've read so many, though not nearly as much as I thought. I've read about half her backlist, but welcome, Lorraine. Thank you so much for being here on my channel. And we have Tori as well from Novel Life, who is equally as big as a fan. If you like historical romance, you probably know who Lorraine Heath is. Um, I thought we would start off, though, by talking about our number one favorite book by Lorraine Heath, including the author herself telling us what her favorite book is. So, um, Tori, do you want to start? I think I know what your favorite is, but... So I picked like a couple because it's hard to like just pick one. So the two paperbacks that I have are these two. So Scoundrel of My Heart, which is the first in the Once Upon a Dukedom series, which is like one of her newer ones. Yeah. And then Falling in Bed with the Duke, which I, I think this may have been one of my first books I've ever read by Lorraine Heath. And I just oh, I fell in love with this. Fell in love with this one. But <laughs> but I do love The Duke and Lady in Red. And that's how uh, you say your favorite is. Yeah, I don't have a paperback. Yeah, I don't have the paperback of that one. And then I just read Midnight Pleasures with a Scoundrel. Pretty that's good. a step back. It's yeah. so pretty. So, yeah. Those are just some of my favorites because it's so hard to pick one. <laughs> Everybody's excited to be here. Um, I don't know if you're frozen or not. Lorraine, do you have a favorite book of yours that you would share? Number one. Uh, you know, it, it's really hard to choose one. Um, usually the one I'm writing is my favorite. But I also find that my favorite can depend upon the mood that I'm in or the mm -hmm. book that I need at the time. Um, so there's um, the Duke and Lydia in Red. Part of mine is Waking Up with the Duke, uh, Lord of Wicked Intentions. Just uh, again, a lot of time on that moment. And I even find that when I'm writing, what I need at that moment is what I sort of. I'm going to put my characters through and maybe resolve personally. So it's hard to pick a favorite. Mm -hmm. um, your audio is going a little in and out. Is that for you, Tori? Can you hear her? Uh, it's going in and out as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we heard most of that, of what you okay. said. Um, of, but you're just a little bit glitchy with the audio. Um, but I agree that there's just many that are my favorites um, from you, including the one I don't have is The Earl Takes All, which I think is the wildest of your plots. Um, maybe not the wildest. I feel like the one with the twins is the most wild. I'm forgetting the title off the top of my head. But um, The Earl Takes All, I love when there's uh, like an off limits romance. And that's definitely off limits. And that one is my absolute favorite of yours. And I just loved everything about it. People told me that would be my favorite because I love romances like that. And it definitely was my favorite. Um, I think you're known for your plot twists and crazy plots. Um, a lot of people had asked me, where do you get your inspiration for your romances? Unless you're frozen now. I think you froze again. Yep. Mm. I'm sorry. We I can hear you. Again. Okay. Okay, great. Am I back? We hear I can you, hear but you're now. Frozen. Okay. Okay. I wonder if I would do better on my iPad. Um, okay. I've... Do you want to switch your okay, iPad? I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, okay, let's try it just for a second here. Um, All right. Did you ask a question? Um, I had asked where you get your inspiration for your plots because a lot of them have crazy twists and they're super angsty and emotional. So what usually happens is uh, when I'm researching one book, 
I will run across um, a little tidbit that will spark the idea in the book. Um, so am I still going in and out? Um, you're just a, a little glitchy on the audio. I can understand what you're saying, though, but you're still frozen. Okay. I wonder. Okay. Just to get of the headphones and mic and see if that makes a difference. Okay. Um, just going to share comments of what people said are their favorites until we get her back. <laughs> Is the when the Marquis falls? That's where you're reading right now, right? Yeah, that's the novella. Yeah, these are two that I read. I read and cried during. So, <laughs> yeah, I uh, yeah, the Duke and Lady in Red. I definitely cried. Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing when she's going back. We have. I don't know if I read this one. I haven't read that one. I don't think I did. I don't know what series this one's in. I she has ones. Yeah, I haven't gotten to her Texas series yet. So I have this one, which I think is one of her first ones. And then this one. Which has that back, which is super pretty. Yeah, it's so pretty. Okay. Okay. Now she's back. <laughs> I can't figure out. All right, hello? To change the yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I couldn't figure out how to change my, oh, I found it, I'm sorry. It's okay. Let's see. Let's see if this is better, is this better? Um, we can hear you. You can hear me. Yes. Do I keep talking? Um, you're still going in and out a little though. But we can see your video now. So Maybe this is it. I I've all my other devices, but I'm so sorry. That's um, okay. I don't know if it's oh, this might be better. So uh, what I was going to mention was um, the Earl Takes All, for example. Um, um, Karen, avoid any spoilers, um, pregnant, and she. We still can't hear you now. I think it might be the internet connection. Oh no. Mm -hmm. Let me. See if I can message. Sorry, everybody. We were fine before we went live. And then as soon as we went live. But continue to let us know your favorites in the comments. I know she has a huge backlist. Mm -hmm. I did just read uh, Once once More, My Darling Rogue. Uh-huh. Which, did you like that one? Because mm -hmm. it's an amnesia one. And I was, uh -huh. when I read it, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I feel like Jess is going to love this one. I didn't yeah. know if you read it. This is one of the first ones I read in 2021. Didn't Lisa, Lisa 2021? give that recommendation to you? Yes. Yeah. Yes, because of the the amnesia trope. And it's kind of like Overboard, uh, the movie. It's really good. I will say I wanted to punch him in the face in that book. I was like, I get it. Okay. Let's see if this works better. Oh, oh, it's already a lot better. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Oh. I don't want to oh. jinx it, though. <laughs> All right, go ahead. 
Yeah, so uh, what I was saying was like in the Earl Takes All, when the uh, heroine is, uh, she gives birth, but she's never had a relationship with the hero. And I didn't want her to be nursing when they had a relationship. And so what I did was I started researching baby formula, or Victorian baby formula, because I needed to figure out, okay, I knew she wouldn't hire a wet nurse. Um, and what came up was Victorian baby farming. And I thought, well, that's interesting. What is that? And so I went down the rabbit hole of researching that, which is when uh, children were born out of wedlock, a lot of times their parents would, or the unwed mother would uh, give them up, would give them to a baby farmer to raise. And so that sparked the idea for the next series where I would have um, children born out of wedlock who were raised by the same woman. And so they formed a family. Um, and so that's what usually happens is that it's when I'm doing my research that something comes up. Ah, that's really interesting. So I have a, just a really quick question because this is one of my favorites. And I know in here you talk yeah. about um, in the author's note, it's similar to dyslexia. I don't know if I can pronounce it right. Dyscalculia? Probably. <laughs> I don't pronounce it right either, but yeah. Yeah, where did you get that kind of, did that come up when you were researching for a different book or kind of like what sparked that one? So what sparked that one actually is that I had a friend many years ago um, whose son uh, had that condition and she was often uh, explaining the challenges that she faced uh, with the school system uh, and trying to get him uh, somebody who would work with him and understand that it wasn't that he was stupid. It was that he just saw things differently. And so um, when I was looking for something to make this hero a little bit different and to give him a challenge, um, I decided to go with that. I love that. I love disability representation really in any romance book. So when I read that, I was like, oh, I love him so much. How long do you take in the researching process for your books? I cannot imagine trying to write a historical romance and trying to get like all the research for one. So I imagine it takes a long time. Because I have, uh, I use the same time period uh, for most of my books between 1850 and 1890. Uh, the general research of what has happened during that time period is, has accumulated over the years. Uh, got 46 novels now, but um, the specifics that I need for a book usually happens, the research for that usually happens while I'm writing the book, because I don't always know exactly what I need, and it's real easy for me to fall down the research rabbit hole, and I would probably spend all my time researching if I was, if I didn't go ahead and start writing, so I will start writing and then see what is it that I need to know specifically for this, um, for this book? That's so, kind of, oh, go ahead. No, no I, I was just going to say, so uh, I don't really know how much time it takes. It just depends mm -hmm. on what it is I need to research. That kind of relates to a question someone had asked of, do you plan out like, who's going to get what in each book or does it kind of like come to you as you write, especially like if a series and you have like, Oh, I know these four characters are getting books. Do you know exactly like what their romance will be when you start the series or does it happen as it goes? Um, for me, it pretty much happens as it goes. Sometimes I'll have an idea. Um, like when I started um, um, the series that has a, uh, a zero desires in it. I think that's the the Lost Lords. No, no, that's not. Oh, anyway. Um, oh, the Hellions of Havisham. Uh, when I started that, I knew what the second book in the series was going to be. I knew it was going to be the twin story, um, and I wasn't really sure what the first book would be, and I didn't know what the third book would be. But I went ahead and wrote the first book. Um, as it came to me as I was writing, um, because I wanted the readers to get a chance to kind of know the characters before I did the second book. But um, for the most 
part, the story ideas come to me just before I start writing the next story. But not always. Sometimes I, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> the thing about writing is that every book is different and just everything always uh, comes differently. And so it's always a new experience. I really love... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, going off of this, because I know Jack Dodger comes up so much. Um, how do you like keep track? Because I know on your website, you kind of have, I, I found it and I sent it to Jess where you have like three of the series that are not interconnected, but you know, they're children or they're, you know, different characters. How do you keep track of them? Do you use something like that? Um, I have a, um, an electronic notebook where I uh, keep track of uh, information in each book so that I can refer back to it. Unfortunately, I'm not as good as I need to be about keeping it current and make, uh, adding the little details. Um, I'll add what I think is important. And then sometimes when I'm working on another book, I realize I really need more information from the other book. I have to go back and flip through them and, and find the information that I need. But um, but the, the main aspects of the books, the character names, their descriptions, and all that, um, I keep in an electronic notebook. Got it. Do you have any other, like, next generation books planned? Because I accidentally read them out of order. The, the is it the Scandalous St. James series and the the other series I read like the kids first and then I went back and read the parents and I love that that you wrote the next generation do you have any others planned for any of your series um so I hope to do um a few more of the children from the scoundrels um because I get so many emails from people wanting to know the other children's mm -hmm. stories particularly Catherine and Luke's and so I do hope to um work them into future stories. Ooh, um, <laughs> I didn't realize they were connected. So I was like, wait a second. Isn't that little boy the hero of the one I just read? And so I thought it was so cute seeing him being adopted. And I loved his character. Yeah. Um, also, do you ever plan on writing back in America again? Because I know a lot of your earlier books were like your Texas books. Do you plan on going back to Texas at all? I would like to at some point. Um, right now, my contracts are all for books written in England. So um, yeah. it just kind of depends what the uh, publishing market is doing and what my editor is uh, editors interested in buying. So that's fair. <laughs> yeah, definitely fair. That totally makes sense. Um, I do. I love your current series right now. Um, and I know the third book, which cover, I absolutely love the cover of that book. And it's coming out, what, in July, I think, right? July, yes. The yes. 26th. Yes, I'm super excited. Do you get a say in the covers of your books? Because I love that you still get to have a Clint cover when a lot of them are kind of moving away from that. So do you get to tell them what you want? Do you see it at all? Uh, they will ask my opinion. Um, they'll send me uh, photos of the cover models so that I can pick out the cover model that I think best represents my characters. Oh, that's cool. And, uh, it is. It's it's a, it's a really hard job, but somebody has to do it, has to look at those <laughs> um, cover models. And um, they'll ask me if I have any... Um, suggestion for poses or if there's a particular color I'd like to see the cover. Um, so I get some input and then after they do their photo shoot, they'll usually send me uh, some of the uh, photos uh, with different poses so that I can pick the photo that I uh, like. And what I find so interesting is that a lot of times um, the models They'll be sitting on a crate or and the you know, background is just white. And then they'll 
that are just really just picking a pose and then they go in and they do all the the uh, graphic work to give you to give me the you know really pretty cover and the or the background you know they'll say you know we're going to do the background with a bed or we're going to do stairs or, or or something like that and uh i just i'm just always uh fascinated and amazed by the wonderful covers that i i get and uh being able to go through the process of selecting the models and then seeing what they did with the photo shoot and picking the pose um, just really ma makes me appreciate um, all their work that goes into making those covers. They're gorgeous. Like I love, I don't think there's even like the older ones, like the new or the like ones that you first wrote, even all those, I love the cover still. Do you think um, they'll ever bring back step backs for some of your books? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I know they're using them less these days. Um, mm -hmm. I think because, um, you don't get to appreciate, get to enjoy the step backs on the electronic books. So, no. um, um, I don't know if they'll, if I'll get step backs. Mm -hmm in the future we love step backs um yeah. i was just showing everybody when you had gone off this one how oh, just yeah. stunning that is it's so that, pretty that was my, my first step back i was so excited it's so pretty it's so gorgeous yeah. do you have a favorite cover or step back of yours if you had to choose a favorite um I really, I really like them all. Um, probably the one that stands out the most um, off the top of my head is the Duke and the Lady in Red. Mm -hmm. um, I'd show that I one. I like red covers. <laughs> yeah. Well, your new one's red. So did you request the red on your new one? Uh, I did. Okay. <laughs> I said it's been a while since I've had a red cover. So. Yeah. I do love the pink and the purple, though, of this one. I really do love that one. Yeah, that one's great. Um, do you know, is your new one going to be in the Mass Max size or the, the regular one? I think I've gone back to the regular size. Okay. I heard they were, so I didn't know. Okay. We just have a special one that's a little bigger <laughs> in the series. Um, oh, this is a good question. So one of my favorite books of yours is the one, I don't want to spoil anything, but the one with the twins. Um and she's like trying to which one is it she's trying to get revenge and so and the other guys like works for the police and so well, that's midnight pleasures yes okay and so that plot twist blew my mind but um christy oh, christy asked there's so many twins in your books do you have twins in your family do you just like writing about twins um i have some twin cousins um uh, but i just i do seem to like to write about twins mm -hmm. so it's so hard not to like spoil the plot twist of that book because I was just, <laughs> I love those little twists you have because even it was this one, they were both like had the like really dark secrets that they kept until the end. And I just, I love the drama that comes with that. So that's why I love your romances. Do you like, like, what do you like about having that like plot twist at the end? Is it always like come to you? Are you, do you know from the beginning that you're like, oh, that's going to be a plot twist? Yeah. Usually, I know from the beginning what the plot twist is going to be, um, mm -hmm. and I, I like having something unexpected uh, show mm -hmm. up in the book. <laughs> um, but sometimes it doesn't come to me um, until I'm writing the book. I'm trying to think of um, that when the Duke was wicked, the one with. Um, where she's holding a basket on the cover. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give anything away there, but it wasn't until I got to, was writing, I, I knew she had a secret. I knew there was some reason that she, yes, that one right there, mm -hmm. that she, um, it was really important to her this, that um, she, she not marry a fortune hunter, that she marry somebody who could love her. And, but it wasn't until I got to the scene where they're alone in uh, 
the cottage that I realized what what her um, why she needed somebody who could love her. So it's probably uh, very subconscious and just one of my like, oh <laughs> this is what I think this is a fun question that Mackie asked. How do you decide which characters fall in love with who? They just kind of come to me. Um, it's uh, it's not necessarily a, a conscious decision. I just, um, as I'm writing, because I, I don't plot, so I just sort of start writing and as I'm writing um, it unfolds usually or sometimes um, like uh, with the Duke and the Lady in Red I had read uh, an article in a sporting magazine a Victorian sporting magazine of all places about uh, some swimming women and I thought oh that, that's who my next hero is gonna fall in love with a swimming <laughs> woman um, so a lot of times it just uh, it just evolves, just kind of comes to me as to who's going to the kind of heroine or hero that the character needs. And I know you have a background in coding, right? Like computer coding. That's what you used to do. Yes, that's what I used to do. How did you get? into writing historical romances. I feel like that's such a different job field. <laughs> well, actually, um, I have a degree in psychology and uh, I couldn't uh, find employment with just a bachelor's degree in psychology. And so I went to work for um, the IRS. And I was a technical writer in the training department. I always loved writing. I always, um, hoped at some point to write a novel. Um, and I was writing course books uh, for the training department. And what happened is that we began to morph into computer-based training courses. And that's how I got into coding. Uh, but my first love and the reason that I started out in training was for the writing. So I've always uh, enjoyed writing. And um, I just... I had um, one of the things that um, I did, excuse me, when I got the job in, uh, the, tech, uh, in the training department, because I didn't have any background doing technical writing, um, I had taken journalism in high school, but I signed up to take a technical writing class at the community college. And the very first night, the instructor asked us to introduce ourselves. And she said, when you introduce yourself, tell us what you would do if money was no object. And she called on me first. And I said, if money was no object, I would buy a house in the hill country. The second floor would be nothing but windows. And I would sit up there and write all day. And uh, everyone kind of looked at me strange, <laughs> strangely, because uh, they were all going to go down the Bahamas and lay on the beach and drink with umbrellas in them <clears throat> but it occurred to me on my way home that if that was my first answer then I needed to um, I needed to give some thought to doing it and so I went home and uh, <clears throat> wrote the first chapter of the story um, and then uh, probably got pregnant and so it was a few more years before I actually sat down and started writing that's awesome. Have you always like read romance books? Um, like how did you, did you just automatically know you wanted to write romance? Um, unlike most writers, I was not much of a reader. And no. the one genre I would not read was romance because I felt like, or I assumed I knew what happened in romance novels. And I didn't think it would appeal to me. Um, I had to go on a business trip uh, while I was working for the IRS and I was gonna be traveling alone. 
So I decided I needed to go get a book and I went to the bookstore and I went to the New York Times section and there was a book with flowers on the cover and the blurb sounded really interesting. And so I thought, well, I'm, I'm gonna read this. I'm gonna get this one. Um, it was Morning Glory by LaVerl Spencer. And I loved the book. It was about um, a couple finding love and overcoming obstacles and had the happily ever after and I just really really loved it and when I got home I went to the bookstore and I went to the fiction section and I couldn't find any other books by Earl Spencer so I asked the clerk if he would special order me some because I knew she had some because they were listed in the front of her book and he said he could do that or I could just go to the romance section <laughs> in the romance section so I had read a romance without realizing I was reading a romance <clears throat> By the end of the month, I'd written, I'd read everything she'd written, and I started, and I fell in love with the genre, and just started reading um, two or three books a week, and I started discovering other authors. Um, and I have a habit when I discovered a new author, I would read their backlist, so I had a, a lot of romance novels to keep me happy. But I discovered that romance was not only what I wanted to read. Uh, but it was what I wanted to write. And so uh, all the stories that I had in my mind to write, they fell into the romance genre. So it just kind of worked out. That's so cool. I actually have that one, Morning Glory, on my shelf. Mm -hmm. I have the one with the step back. That's pretty cool. Um. So your first book published in the 90s. So you've been writing for over 20 years now. Um, how has writing or being an author changed since you first published to now? Has it changed? Um, I think it has um, to an extent. Um, I think um, I think the books uh, that I write now are probably a little bit faster paced, um, and I uh, try different things with my stories now that I probably wasn't doing so much in the beginning. I think that overall, uh, the romance genre. Um, has expanded to be more inclusive and that there's a lot more um, variety in what is written and what is available for readers. And so I think it's helped to expand the genre and to um, make it more welcoming for um, a lot of readers, um, especially those who were like me and thought, you know, that there wasn't anything in romance that would appeal to them. And there, it, there is just so much, it's just such a vast canvas and there's just so many different stories. Um, I just think it's very exciting um, right now with uh, just all the different um, aspects to the stories that, that we can read. I agree. I have been seeing yeah. that as well in romance. Um, I'm trying. Okay, so are there going to be more in the series beyond the first three? And if so, do you know or can you tell us the characters who will get romances? So um, the book that comes out in July, um, The Return of the Duke, that will end the Once Upon a Duke in series. Okay. But the next series is going to be The Chessmen. So um, King's Friends that he met with, uh, they're, they're going to get the next series. Mm -hmm. And so right now I'm working on Knight's story. And then I think it'll probably be Bishop and then Rook. Oh, I love the names. That makes me so excited. <laughs> I'm like trying to keep my excitement like down a little bit. I know someone asked um, in the comments, the unfair question that they had totally oh. totally unfair yep. yeah 
this could be one that you're writing to. You don't have to mention who it is, but I was just curious if you had a favorite couple at all, because I don't know how I could ever choose, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, it's it's hard to, to pick a favorite couple. Because um, mm -hmm. it comes back to um, what is it that I need at the time? So, um, no, I don't think I probably have a favorite couple, probably the one I'm writing right now. <laughs> so I can yeah. get up in the morning and write their story. <laughs> a lot of people sent in questions about your favorite hero or mm -hmm. anything like that. I probably assume it's very hard <laughs> to even choose. It's always going to be the one that you're writing. <laughs> Yes, it's very hard to choose. I'm assuming your answer is going to be similar to what you said for writing in America. Do you ever want to, though, to write something in a different country besides England and America? Um, at this point, um, I haven't had any ideas for a story that would take place in a different country. Um, because of all my research, I'm comfortable with England and America. So um, I don't know that I would ever move to another country. Mm -hmm. uh, it would depend on the characters and uh, if they needed their story to take place elsewhere. Yeah, I know you do have some books where they like some of them. I think they went to like India and then they came back or, you know, they've gone to other countries that are yeah, in the book, but it's not like primarily in that. We do have a question, a question about the Chessman series. Have we met the heroines? No. Oh. <laughs> I like mystery. Mm -hmm. I can figure out who, <laughs> who is, uh, who's who and who's who. <laughs> Uh, how many books in advance do you know you're going to write? So I'm assuming now you have the one that's coming out and then you have three books you know you're going to write. Do you know what comes after that or do you like wait a little bit? At, at this point, I don't know what comes after that. Um, if, if I follow my usual process, probably when I get to the second or third book in the Chessman series, um, it'll spark an idea for the next series. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, oh, Tori, did you have something you're going to ask? Um, I was just looking at the questions that people sent in. Uh, I know we have our favorite, like, tropes that we love to read. Um, I mean, you know, they, I have tons of them. Do you have a specific trope you either like to, like, really write? I know your series, they all have different tropes and plot twists that are crazy and stuff like that. But I didn't know if there was someone... Some, a specific trope that you like to write, and then if it's the same that you like to read, or if they're different. So from a reading standpoint, um, <clears throat> I like all the tropes, and so I don't, I don't really have a favorite trope on, when it comes to reading. When it comes to writing, I kind of like the tropes where one of the characters thinks they're in love with somebody, but they really go with somebody else. Um, I, I seem to have uh, several stories where uh, two men are in love with the same woman and she has to figure out which one is the right one for her. So um, uh, I just, I kind of, I like those triangle things. I also like being able to make it where one of them isn't obviously a bad guy. I like to work it where they're, they're both good guys. It's just that one is better for her than the other. And it's just a matter of her figuring out which one is better for her. I love that. Mm -hmm. that's one of my favorites that's why i i don't know if you would consider like for this one how she she's in love with him but she has to try to go after the duke i just love that angst where it's like but what's best for her but what her heart wants 
and it's so good. I really love this one. Yeah. This is, I think this is the one. Yeah, I read this a couple months ago, so very fresh in my mind with that angst. Griff is one of my favorite characters. I love him. He's just, this, I'm like, I just want to give you a hug. <laughs> Um, do you like, because these heroes are pretty different, right? Because we have a Duke and then we have a, a non-titled. So, right? Isn't he non-titled? Yeah, I think he's, he's like the, he's the Lord, right? Yeah. Who do you prefer writing as a hero? Do you like writing your Duke heroes or do you like it when they're not titled like that? So I like writing. Um, I do like writing characters if they're in nobility um and i like it writing characters who are not uh, the lords when they're not a lord um i find it easier to give them a tougher background because they have to they're kind of self-made men they mm -hmm. nothing was handed to them and so one of the challenges when writing someone um uh, who is a lord who is part of nobility is being able to give them a background that created their character their um, what makes them different from everyone else i am very fascinated by how the nobility puts so much uh, stock in duty and honor and um, i find that aspect of their life very fascinating um and so it just having both kinds of characters just gives me an opportunity to explore different aspects of society as well as character development so for me it's really um whatever can provide me with the most interesting type of character and sometimes they do need to be part of the nobility and sometimes they don't I feel like there's a couple, though, where you've found a way around that because, like, the Scoundrels of St. James series, the first one, where, like, he doesn't know he's nobility. And then with the Lost Lords of Pembroke, it's like, well, they were, but then they ran away and they had to live, like, 10 years as not nobility. And now they're back. So I really liked how you could combine both of those with those series. They get the whole tortured past, but now they have to take on the responsibilities. Yeah. Yeah. So I really yeah, love They were series. fun to ride. Mm -hmm. we love a good tortured hero so <laughs> we love <laughs> the stories um do you think you would ever write more like sea captain romances because i love this one with tristan's character and how he spent all that time at sea and like took her on her trip to go find her uh fiance do you have any more heroes like that you'd like to write because i don't think of the ones i've read a lot of them take place at sea Presently, I don't have any ideas for a story that takes place at sea. Um, but yeah, that one was fun to write. So I don't ever say never because mm -hmm. who knows what will come, come to me someday. But right I, now, I don't. I, um, I know I have cried while reading some of your books, <laughs> specifically The Duke and Lady in Red. I was going to say, was it this one? Yes. <laughs> Have you ever like cried while writing like a scene or anything like that? I do, yeah. And particularly the Duke and the Lady in the Red. Um, yeah, there were some scenes where I, I did have to stop writing um, just because I couldn't see the screen anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, I. I I like when I'm writing and uh, the scene makes me tear up and I hope that it'll make the readers tear up too. So I like to make readers smile and I like to make them tear up. So <laughs> I definitely do that with all, all of your books. I'll like, I have different emotions throughout like the book. <laughs> well, that's good. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> Was it difficult to write um, when the Marquess falls because that doesn't have an HEA? And we knew going in, there's no way for, I mean, I mean, it kind of technically, like 
I don't want to spoil anything because Tori's not done with it, but like, because she's halfway through it right now. That's another one where I cried in and I knew it was going to be sad because like from the first book of the series, you know, she's dead. So, you know, the ending of their story. Was that harder to write knowing that was the end of their story? It was hard in that um, I wanted the reader to still feel good about reading it. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to have that satisfaction at the end of the story. I, I had not originally planned to write the Marcus's story, but when I was writing his son's story, I just felt like I wanted the reader to have a clear idea of um, of his wife and why he loved her to the extent that he did. Mm -hmm. And so uh, <laughs> I, I, when I, after I wrote that story, uh, his son's story, then I asked my editor if I could go ahead and do a novella for him, even though, yes, the reader knows. <sighs> That's gonna end. It was good closure for the series though. So I really appreciated it as a reader. Uh, someone did ask, uh, you write about a lot of difficult situations like PTSD and child abuse. And I know that's in a couple of your series. Is it ever hard as a writer to write about those dark places and situations for your characters? It is challenging um, because I want to make sure that there is a purpose mm -hmm. to either the character development or the story when I do tackle something that's uh, challenging like that or that's um, that is a that does come from a dark place, and I think a part of it is because I have the degree in psychology um, that I try and be uh, very much aware of portraying it as as accurately as I can, but also showing that there. There are ways to overcome uh, some things that the characters are having to deal with. Um, I do like to, um, I like character development and giving characters challenges, I think helps to make them more realistic. Um, and um, so, I do tend to sometimes go to the dark places just because I don't want to say it makes them more interesting, but I like for them to have had something that shaped their character. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause I think a lot of, I mean, I probably read about 12 of your books now. I know you have a huge backlist, but <laughs> I noticed um, you make, your story is like a perfect blend of the character development and the character driven story with a plot driven story. And there's so much depth to both of those things, the plot and the characters, which is why I think like, I just, I love reading your stories because it's just, you get this all encompassing story of both the character development and how that kind of plays into the plot of the story. So yeah, definitely. It just makes a beautiful story, like a well-rounded all around beautiful story. Well, thank you. Do you have any books that you started writing or even finished writing that you decided you didn't want to publish, that you just haven't gotten around to publishing? Any unfinished things that are just put to the side for now? Um, I do. When I started writing, uh, I didn't have a computer. Uh, I had a typewriter. And Ooh. so I wrote about five stories uh, with the typewriter, uh, it's, it was no fun going back trying to edit them and retype them. And so I finished <laughs> one, moved on to the other. Um, and one, one day I came home from work and my typewriter was gone. And it was a computer. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, my husband had surprised me. He said, I think you're okay. serious. <laughs> writing stuff and so uh, and, and at the time we really couldn't afford the computer but uh, 
So I have those five stories that will probably never see the light of an editor's desk. Every now and then I look at them and I think, well, maybe, but no. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when I, but when I got the computer, I sat down and started writing a new story because it wasn't any fun to go and input something I'd already written. And that ended up being the first book that I published. So I do have those five stories from before. And um, sometimes um, I'll wake up in the middle of the night with an idea and I'll get up and maybe write the prologue to a story. So I have several prologues that have no story attached to them um, or several scenes that uh, I think maybe someday the right character will come and this will be their story. I just haven't met that character yet. So for me, the characters are very um, real. So um, it's just a matter of me getting to know them and figuring out what their story is. I do have um, a, a question. It's like kind of like different tropes, but I know you have the Girls of Flight City yes coming out which is more of like a historical fiction story yep. and i'm someone who i also love reading historical romances but i also love historical fiction um so i was just wondering like um like how did that story kind of i know it's not out yet but like how did that story come up for you like did you get an idea while researching or anything like that well, actually, about uh, 30 years ago, there was an article in the Dallas Morning News about a woman in Terrell, Texas, which is about 45 minutes from Dallas. Um, her name was Virginia Brewer, and she tended to the British Cemetery in Terrell, Texas. And that was the first time that I ever heard about there being British, the British Cemetery. Uh, in Terrell, Texas. And as I researched it um, a little bit and discovered that during World War II, they sent uh, British pilots over to uh, a civilian flight school in Terrell, Texas to be trained. And so it was something that I thought, well, once romance moves into World War II, I want to write a story about this school in Terrell. But uh, romance still hasn't really moved into World War II but uh, women's fiction has. And so I thought now is the time I need to, to tell this story, which um, I found very fascinating that uh, before we even got involved, before uh, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, we were already training British pilots over here and they were doing it kind of under the radar because they didn't want him to find out because we had, we had the neutrality acts and said that we wouldn't support anybody fighting Hitler and so mm -hmm. um, it was so they would send these pi uh, these cadets over they'd have to take a um, ship across the Atlantic where the German U boats were patrolling and they didn't know if they were going to get uh, torpedoed. Uh, they had to go to Canada. Uh, in Canada, they would um, resign from the RAF and they would be given suits. They would get on a train and they would take, there were six schools across the southern United States and they would go to one of those schools. Uh, they weren't allowed to talk about the war. They weren't allowed to wear their uniforms in town. Uh, they just had to stay as low key as possible. And so I just found it fascinating history. And not only that, but so many women were involved in the school. They were the control tower operators, the mechanics, the instructors, the flight simulator operators. And so it just, just made a, a story that fascinated me. I'm hoping that, that readers will find it as interesting. I am extremely excited for that book. Um, my friend messaged me. She was like, did you know Lorraine Heath was writing this? And I was like, yeah, I'm so excited for it. <laughs> well, and, it, and while it is not a romance, it does have love stories in it. Um, yeah, yeah. That's how most historical, <laughs> yeah, historical fiction, women's fiction, a lot of the books that I read 
I like that kind of genre because it has a romance in it, even though it's not a romance. <laughs> and um, we had talked about this before we went live, but I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Lorraine has a pen name that she wrote her young adult books under of Rachel Hawthorne. I read these when I was like 15 years old. And so I think that's amazing that you were writing these and I was reading you and now I'm 28 now. So like 13 years later, I'm loving your historicals. The Boyfriend League, I swear I've read like 10 times. It was my favorite in high school and I was obsessed with it. And your Paranormal series, I remember vividly reading that in high school. Would you ever write like Paranormal again? Because I feel like that's very out of your norm of what I would expect from you considering we read your historicals and then your contemporary young adult I I would actually I, I enjoyed writing the paranormal but again yeah. it's just a matter of you know when the story comes to me um I wrote um I don't know if you wrote no I wrote uh, a vampire trilogy with my son uh, oh. Jay London. uh it's called the darkness before dawn series and um I actually wrote another pirate book that was a young adult as uh, Jade Parker. Oh, so uh, I didn't know that. But uh, so yeah, it just kind of depends on the stories that come to me, usually in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So, but. Uh, this is also a, a fun question. So Bridgerton, I'm sure you've heard of Bridgerton and how that blew up last year. Um, have you ever been offered adaptation for any of your books? Into TV? Um, actually, the only ones I have been offered um, that were optioned for a TV series was the um, Rachel Hawthorne um, werewolf series. Ah. So, um, and so what usually happens uh, is that um, the producer or director options a book and then uh, they try and um, either adapt it or find somebody who will help finance it. And um, sometimes that happens and sometimes that doesn't. So with um, the Werewolf series or the Shapeshifter series, um, I think they, they'd done a script and they had some interest, um, but they were never never able to find a, a TV station that would actually um, show it. And so they didn't uh, move forward with it. So oh. that's the only thing I've ever had an offer on. Is there a series? Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna ask, I know you mentioned you wrote with your son. Is your son a writer as well? He is. Uh, he hasn't published anything under his name. Uh, well, he's published um, a couple of short stories, but uh, but yeah, he still he still writes. He still um, hopes to publish a book someday under his, just his cool. name. Yeah. Is there one of your series that you would love to see as a TV show or movie? Uh, I'd love to see the scoundrels of St. James. I think um, I think because of the characters, because part of it takes place in the aristocracy and part of it doesn't, that it would allow for exploration of all the different aspects of uh, Victorian England at that time. Um, and so I think it could be very interesting. Plus each of the stories is so very different. Mm -hmm. Definitely agree. <laughs> I agree. And then they could do the spinoff with the children. Yeah. So it would be perfect <laughs> to use that. Um, we are coming to the end of our hour. If there's any last minute questions, um, Lorraine, you've also offered a giveaway for uh, the first two in the series, which is very exciting. And um, do you want to keep that US only? I want to double check what you want to do. Oh, uh, whatever's easier for you. Yeah. Okay. That's whatever you prefer. Okay. Um, and we're going to pick, you said two sets? Two sets. Okay. Um, in the comments, we will pick two people to win a set of these two books, which are, I believe, both these five stars. I absolutely love them. 
Um, the pining in this book, I don't know if I've already said that, is just amazing. I love it when there's mutual pining in a romance and when there's a class difference. It's just so good. Um, workplace, so, workplace romance. <laughs> yes, just like checks all the boxes. Yeah. Um, so I will scroll through the comments um, to pick a couple winners and let us know if you have any last minute questions before we we end our time. I've loved learning everything about your writing and your writing process and getting started into writing romance. You have just like the best getting started into writing romance story. I love that. All right, we're gonna choose Hoarding Books is our first winner. Um, I don't know if, if you're here, are you here? Hoarding Books, if you're here, comment and let me know. And I'll pick another one in the comments. I'm just scrolling randomly in the comments to pick someone. Are there any other questions? Um, Christy asked no. her their bookstores where she signs at. Ah. Uh, I'm sorry. Do you have any bookstores? Oh, are there any bookstores where you have your assigned copies of your books available? You know, it is so hard to believe, but there really is not a yeah, independent or really romance friendly bookstore in the Dallas area, or at least not one that I have found. Um, so I don't have a way to get readers autograph books. I really wish mm. I did. All right, I'm going to pick uh, Christy Jenner. Aw, I like this comment too. It said I fell in love with her at the start of her career from book one. Um, so Christy, you are our other winner. I don't see though the other person is still here. So, um, I will pick a different one. Um, oh, Christy is still here. I see you, you comment something else. Um, Christy, if you want to email me, my email is in the uh, description. I'll get all of your information to give to Lorraine. I'll pick one person. I hope Christy's still here. She hasn't commented. That's always the problem with these. I have to make sure that they're still around for when they comment in the, in the initial one, but I'm assuming she's still here. Um, the next one will be Diana. If you guys are both here, so we have Christy and Diana. Email me. My email is in the description, and I will get all your information and pass it along to Lorraine. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions other than that. I don't see any other questions. Tori, do you have any other last minute questions? No, pretty much asked everything and threw some yeah. through something that I had. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, that's all we have then. Thank you so, so much for talking to us. We are just the biggest fangirls of your books. And I'm happy you have so many books you've written because now I still have like over 20 to get through. So um, I'm excited to read even more of your books. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. I'm sorry about the communication in the beginning, but I'm glad that's, it worked. That's, that's yeah. exactly. We've, we've all been there. Yes. <laughs> happens all the time and it's very annoying, but we're glad we got it fixed and it was fun talking to you. All right. Um, thank you everybody so much for joining in the comments. We enjoyed your excitement and your questions. Um, and we will see everybody later. So if you won, make sure you email me. Um, I didn't see Christy comment again after <laughs> she commented. So hopefully everybody saw that. Um, but thank you. And we'll see everybody later. Bye. Right. Thank Bye. you. Good night.